seasons, right? Summer, fall, fall winter, winter, spring. And it has to do with what we call the Sun-Earth-Moon system. Moon doesn't play so much of a part in this one, but this is an example of the Sun-Earth-Moon system. And we know that the Earth orbits around the Sun. It arounds the sun. It actually makes an elliptical orbit. This is a perfect circle sur orbit, but it makes an elliptical orbit. So we're going to use this sun, and we're going to grab that Earth over there and make a little elliptical orbit. This is a great question. You know, they did a survey, and most college students who were asked this question got it wrong. So let's look, take a little quick close-up of the Earth. Do you see that red X? That's where we are, right there, Springfield, Pennsylvania, home of Springfield students and Northwestern Wildcats. All right, so the way this travels around the, the sun is an elliptical orbit, Doo -doo -doo. not quite a perfect circle. And a lot of college kids say, can you walk around with that? Say, oh, hey, guess what? It, it's because sometimes we're closer to the sun. No, that's not quite it. It's because of, okay, that's a crazy <laughs> orbit you're doing. It's because of the fact that the Earth is tilted. It's the fact that the Earth is tilted. Now, that red X is right here. You can't see it. But when we are tilted right at the sun and the sun's rays are hitting us, remember, the sun is a lot bigger than the Earth. But when the sun's rays are hitting us, it is summer. Do, do, do. They're hitting us directly. The sun's rays are hitting us directly. You know what it feels like when you're out there on the beach and the sun's rays are hitting you directly. It heats you up. So this is summertime. When the earth is straight up and down and spinning on its axis, we have our fall and our spring because we are getting just an even amount. We are getting an even amount of that sunlight. And when we are tilted away from the sun, we just get glancing little bits of the sun's rays. So this is winter, when we're tilted away. So it all has to do with the tilt of the earth. Summer, towards the earth. Winter, away from the earth. And spring and fall, when we are just straight up and down and just getting in between glances. And that's also the reason we have our polar ice caps, because these guys never get direct rays from the sun. No matter how we tilt it, we never get direct rays from the sun. And it's also why we have our tropical regions where it's always warm around the equator, because these guys are always getting direct rays from the sun. Now, that's a great question. Great question. Glad you asked it. Hey, Mr. Howes and Roland, what is a leap year? Another great question, and another question involving the Sun-Earth-Moon system. Why do we have a leap year? It's just a year when we like to jump around, right? Boop. Leap year, leap year. No, wait, 2020 was a leap year. This isn't a leap year. All right, for real, why do we have a leap year? It's because the calendar was made by humans, and the Earth doesn't really listen to humans that much. So, in our calendar, we say, hey, it will take... 365 days to make one year. That means 365 days to make one trip around the sun. So think about that. On your birthday, every day on your birthday, you've made one more trip around the sun. But it's not quite 365 days. It's actually 365 and a quarter. Actually, it's actually 365.2412 
one one something, a little less than a quarter, but it's about 365 days and a quarter to travel once around the sun. So, four quarters make what? One whole. Four quarters make a whole. So every four years, we add an extra day. We add an extra day to set off the balance. If, think about it, if we didn't, if we didn't do that in four years, our calendar would be off by one day. And eventually. Yeah, in a hundred years, we'd be off by 25 days. And in a couple hundred years, we'd start having summer in the middle of February. Hmm. So it would be off. And uh, let's look at when this started. It's pretty neat. Who started this and when they finally actually added the leap year. It's pretty cool. So the leap year in the Western calendar was first introduced over 2,000 years ago by this guy, a Roman general named Julius Caesar. And the calendar was even named after him, the Julian calendar. calendar. And uh, he had just one rule. Any year evenly divisible by four would be a leap year. So, you know, every four years, there was a leap year. But he still couldn't account for losing 11 minutes a year. And that didn't come until, until this guy came along. Uh, in 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th revised the Julian calendar by creating the Gregorian calendar. And it was pretty much the same idea, but he said that there should not be leap days in any years ending in zero, zero, unless the year is divisible by 400. This addition corrected the fact that it's not exactly 365 and a quarter days. In fact, the solar year occurs every period of 365.2422 days, a little bit less. And that accounted for that lost 11 minutes. And that's how we have our calendars now that keep the seasons in check. All right, let's take a look at the next question. Hey, Mr. Howell and Roland, what animals have been to space? Yeah. Huh, what do you think of that? Have there ever been animals in outer space? Uh, hmm. Well, huh. I'm not sure if microorganisms count, but didn't Perseverance, the new Mars rover, pick up life? Like, or not life, but signs that life used to be there? Well, okay, if we're talking about life on other planets, that's a different thing. But yes, there were signs of water. Um, on Mars, and, it, and if there was water, then there's a good chance that there could have been microorganisms, because living things need water. I think they mean, did we ever send an animal into space? Has an animal ever been an astronaut? Oh. Yeah, and the answer to that is yes. As a matter of fact, the first astronauts were actually, cosmonauts, were actually animals. And let's take a, a look at some of these first brave explorers. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't make it back um, alive, but that was before PETA's time, which is an organization that tells you, hey, you can't do that to animals. So these were our first explorers, our first heroes of space travel. Let's take a look at some of them. So over the years, there has been a lot of animals in space, but it was 1947 when the first animal was put into space. And perhaps surprisingly, it was the humble fruit fly American scientists were trying to establish the impact of cosmic radiation it might have on future astronauts. And a missile recovered from Nazis at the end of World War II was loaded with fruit flies and it traveled 109 kilometers into the air, the distance at which space officially begins. On its descent back to Earth, the capsule containing the flies parachuted down to New Mexico. And on, upon opening it, the scientists found that the flies were alive and with no evidence of irradiation. So that was the start of a long line of astronaut animals to come. Incredibly, there have been 32 monkeys and apes that have been to space. The very first was a rhesus called Albert II. In 1949, he reached 134 kilometers. 
These rodents have long been used to find out more about how space travel will affect the human body. In fact, NASA has re recently published a detailed study of mice housed at the International Space Station. It shows that mice quickly adapt to microgravity conditions. But the first mouse went into space in 1950, reaching an altitude of 137 kilometers. A number of dogs have gone into space under the former Soviet Union, Union but the most well-known was Laika in 1957. She was actually a stray picked up off the street uh, in Moscow and was deemed a, a good cosmonaut because of her gentle temperament. The scientists thought that she could handle and cope with the adverse conditions. Uh, other dogs have been launched into space, but Laika is the most famous because she's the first animal to orbit the Earth. What was the first animal to orbit the moon, you might ask? Well, slow and steady wins the race. Because the tortoise in 1968 was, completed a circuit around the moon after six days and then returned to Earth. Though the plan had been for it to land in Kazakhstan, the capsule veered off course and was eventually found in the Indian Ocean. Thankfully, the tortoises were still alive. They just lost a little weight. These amphibians have been helping make one great leap for mankind since 1959. However, the most famous frog flight didn't come till 1970 when NASA launched the orbiting frog Olithith spacecraft containing two bullfrogs. It helped them understand how to control motion sickness in outer space. So in 1969, the next animal in outer space was obviously the human being. But after that, 1973, two garden spiders called Anita and Arabella were used in an experiment to see if they could spin webs in space. And this experiment was actually the brainchild of a high school student named Judith Miles. Both spiders did manage to spin webs. The first aquanauts to reach space were a type of minnow found in salt marshes. These guys, plus 50 eggs, were sent up in 1973, and NASA was keen to observe the effects of microgravity on animals that moved in three dimensions on Earth, like fish do in the water. All right, these guys look like they belong in outer space, don't they? But nope, they're from right here on good old Earth. In 2007, Tardigrades were first animals to survive outer space. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic, means you can't see them unless you have a microscope, invertebrates that are able to deal with almost anything on Earth. So perhaps it's no surprise. They can deal with lack of oxygen, radiation, freezing cold, dehydration. Nothing faces these guys. The tardigrades were dried out before the flight and then orbited the Earth outside of a rocket for 10 days. And then they were rehydrated on their return to Earth. And scientists discovered that 68% of the minutes survived the extreme cold and space radiation. Whew. And that's just a few of the many animals that have been to outer space, including these guys. Ants were set up there as part of another high school kids project, science project. And who knows what we're going to send up there next. What will be the first animals on Mars? Hey, Mali Yang, that concludes the episode. Wow, well, you guys are out of this world. I want to be an astronaut. I want to go to the moon. Malia Science. Science.